Lori Drowdy learned how to live life with gusto growing up in a Marine Corps family. And in her adult life, she's applied that attitude while working as everything from a motivational speaker to a tech guru to an actor performing her life story off-Broadway. But it's her first job out of the University of San Diego that's defined her more than anything else. After earning her wings of gold and flying F-18s out of a shore base, she was part of the first wave of female integration into carrier air wings. Years full of challenges, tragedies, and triumph. So for all the details of those highs and lows, let's talk to Lori. So what influenced you to select naval aviation out of your NROTC there at uh, University of San Diego? The funny thing is that growing up the daughter of a Marine Corps infantry officer, I had never been exposed to aviators. You know, I like to joke the only time I ever heard about aviators was my dad complaining about them. So um, I didn't really, I didn't even know that aviation was an option for me. And then my freshman year of college, my Navy ROTC unit did a field trip to uh, several naval air stations and Marine Corps air stations in Southern California. So this was back when um, Marine Corps air station El Toro and Tustin were around. But this field trip literally changed my life because going into ROTC, I just, you know, I wanted to serve. I thought that I would be, uh, you know, a, an administrative officer or a supply officer. Um, and I didn't even know that I could fly as a woman. And so on this field trip, you know, all the pilots we talked to were men, but, I was just fascinated by the aircraft. Like I'd never been up close to jets before or helicopters or any of that. Um, and the pilots were hilarious. And I just thought, this looks like such a cool thing to do, but you know, I don't know if I can even do it. And they're like, oh no, you know, actually there are a few women and they are instructor pilots or they're support pilots. So it's actually something you could do. And so uh, when I got back to school, I went flying with a friend of mine who was a um, you know civilian pilot. And he took me up in a Cessna and I was like, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where you, you, you just never forget. And, you know, seeing the world from that perspective and the, the process and the procedures and, um, and just the views were amazing. And so I thought, this is definitely what I want to do. You go down to Pensacola. How did your flight school experience go? I majored in mathematics. I love math. So, you know, navigation, um, even the aerospace stuff, it was challenging, but I, I understood it and it was fun. Oh, actually, I have a really funny story to tell about T2s, though. Um, we went out and we landed on the carrier and, I, you know, I'm the only female student and um, we were all on the flight deck. We were getting refueled. And so they had like three of us lined up, three T2s lined up and um one of the other students in my class, I didn't even know this was happening, but one of the other students in my class said that um, one of the guys on the aircraft carrier, because back then it was all men, this was before women were integrated. Um, one of the um, one of the handlers was, you know, on his headset and he he looks up at the at my fellow student in the cockpit and, and then he kind of like looks over at my jet and he goes like that. And my, my friend, my, the other students like, yeah. And all of a sudden he gets on the radio and like, I get all these guys fueling me all at once. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just funny because I don't think they were used to having female students out there. There just weren't that many of us going through, but anyway. yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking what would happen if somebody used that gesture like to now. No, the, that would not HR, fly. <laughs> HR yeah. hotline oh complaint, you know, yeah, no. exactly. And, are, and this is sort of what we're talking about during this episode yeah. is all of this groundbreaking Wild West stuff that you you pioneered and had to and, and went through. Yeah. Um, so you get to A4s and CQ again and get your wings. So yep. what were the options you had as a female naval aviator when you yeah. got your wings? How, how, what was that all about? It was, you know, pretty much what the guys previously had told me. I could be an instructor pilot. Um, I could, you know, do the sir grad thing where you stay back and you teach um, the 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 av the non winged aviators how to fly and you get wing they get winged, or I could be a support pilot and that's what I ended up doing. So uh, which was great because that meant I got to fly F 18s in a support squadron. So. Um, I so I, I went to VAQ 34. It was a support squadron based out of Lemoore, California. And my job was to fly F 18s really fast um, so that other uh, pilots could practice tracking me as a missile, um, or ships could pretend that, you know, I was a missile and they'd practice tracking me and pretend to shoot me. So, um, which was, you know, I'm like, 
hey, whatever helps the effort, <laughs> you know, and if I get to fly an F-18 while doing it, sweet. Um, so yeah, I did that for a year. And then VAQ-34 was on the BRAC list, the base realignment and closing. I think that's what it stood for. You know, back in the early 90s, early mid 90s, when to save money, the government was shutting down a lot of bases, closing a lot of squadrons. Um, VAQ-34 was one of those squadrons. Um, but right around that time as well, um, actually when I was in A4s as a student, um, Tailhook 91 happened, the Gulf War had happened, um, there was a lot, of, I think, previous to that, the Clarence Thomas, uh, you know, um, hearings were held. So there was a lot of attention being paid to what women could and could not do, as well as how they were treated. And so a lot of things came together um, right around that time. And in 93, the, uh, the ban on women flying in combat aircraft was lifted. So that's when I transitioned over to S3Bs and went down to San Diego and then became part of the, um, the, the first West Coast deployment to have women in combat jet squadrons on the Abraham Lincoln. So did you have to apply? Was there like an, an all nav that you had to put your name in the hat or how, how did you go from VAQ to VS? You know, I think it was similar to um, any jet selection that you go through or any you know, um, aircraft type selection you go through. You put your list together. Um, of what you would like and you send that to the detailer and, and then it's always needs of the Navy. So um, needs of the Navy take precedence as they, they should. And there were already a few women going through the Hornet squadron. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I had had a really challenging time as a student going through um, VFA-125. Um, it, again, this was right after tail hook. Um, a couple of the instructors were being investigated. Actually, several of them were and I was the only female student going through and it just was not a great time, <laughs> not a great place to be a, a, a female student. And, um, and so let's, yeah. let's, let's put a finer point on that. So okay. without naming names or whatever, yeah. so what, what just the general atmosphere where the thing said, was there a double standard where you were people rolling in on you in terms of the grading standard? Uh, what, what, what was happening yeah. at one twenty five? The funny thing is that it was it was almost the exact opposite. Like um, when I was in the training command, I felt like um, you know when I go out on the flight, of course you're being evaluated, but you're also be getting instructed. Um, and when I was at VFA 125, I was I felt like no one would talk with me. Um, and when I flew. Um, I felt like I wasn't getting any instruction. I felt like every flight was like a check flight. And it was, um, it was very, I don't know what the feeling, the feeling was just very isolating. Um, so this was different than when you were a flight student, an yeah. undergraduate flight student, um, when you weren't an anomaly and, and suddenly yeah. you are the only female in an avi a tactical aviation squad or more or less. I mean, it's the rag, but yeah. um, you, so it was like a, a noticeable different dynamic at that point. Absolutely. And I think one of the key differences was um, in my A4 squadron in VT-22, the XO um, was Chuck Nesby. I, I don't know if you knew him, Sneakers, um, a black F-14 pilot. Weren't a whole yeah. lot of them either. And I think yeah. he was, you know, he was such an amazing mentor for me. And he, um, and I think the fact that he was part of the leadership team there and the skipper was awesome as well. Um, I never felt, you know, even though I'm sure that there were other guys and in, in other students and other instructors in the training command, it just wasn't, um, it, it was different. And you know how it is in, in naval aviation. There's definitely like this hierarchy that um, uh, pilots like to put themselves into of the pointy nose guys, you know, versus the, the non -point, pointy nose guys or single seat versus crews. And so I think that being in the F-18 training squadron, you know, it was like the machoist of the macho. <laughs> well, maybe not as much as a Tomcat squadron. Sorry. I, well, that I, back. Say, <laughs> I know are, you, yeah. <laughs> us, these are just a bunch of glorified A-7 drivers, but I'm going to take a lot of grief <laughs> in the comments for saying that. But, you know, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, no worries. I'm glad that they were feeling good about themselves. That's what we want from yeah. our, yeah. Light attack community, you know, but I, I get it. I totally get it. It's, yeah. and, and so it's, it's at once understandable, but um, it, it, you know, in hindsight, it seems uh, sort of um, 
dated, right? Uh, you know. So I, anyway, when you think about all the circumstances that was hap- that were happening at that time, Tailhook ninety one, you know, um, was a big, huge, huge thing, um, and and so I think, I'll, and I'm not going to justify the things that happened there at all, um, but. It's understandable. Let's, let's just review really okay. quickly because maybe not everybody knows what Tale of 91. Yeah, uh, fair. fair was, right? yeah. So, um, you know, it, it was the Tale of Convention used to go on at Las Vegas. The third floor was was notorious um, for Analax and sort of, you know, sophomoric things. There were a whole yeah. bunch of what we call admins, which were hospitality suites from various commands. Um, I think because I was at 90, I wasn't at 91, and, and 90 was starting to get a little bit out, out of control too. It was a total crush of humanity on the third floor. Um, and I think the difference between 90 and 91 was, as you say, desert storm. So oh, I yeah. think what happened is you got these animal acts, and ironically, the, the, the guilty bastards were basically flight students who didn't have any arrested landings and a, a squadron that was decommissioned that no longer had airplanes. You know, and so I, I don't think any of the perpetrators uh, were actually members of the Tailhook Association. Wow. <laughs> um, so it, it it went high order, let's just say. There was sexual battery. So never mind, you know, the trappings of, of, of a convention and, and over the top antics. This this was uh, people uh, were were pawed and 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 there was sexual battery. So that's where it, it becomes un- unsat. And, and yeah. that's where it became uh, something that, that spurred this investigation that basically came close to, to shutting down uh, the Taylor Association. And only yeah. its utility, its organic utility, has, as a fantastic professional association, I've been a member forever uh, yeah. and remain one today, um, kept it alive. So, um, and now it's... For the unlearned, the the word tailhook is synonymous with the the scandal and and that whole era. Yeah. So it, it was as a function of that, it was a a watershed moment for equal treatment of female service members in general. Uh, but also, it became a catalyst to try to integrate females more comprehensively into carrier aviation, particularly. Um, right. so, like you said, so now you're in 125 when all the confluence of all these things is going on, not to mention yep. the war. Yep. And then other things, like you said, Clarence Thomas and Anita yep. Hill. And there's this thing happening in America. It's kind of like, really, guys, is this how we're going to treat the women in our lives? Kind of a thing, you know, well, especially after women had died in the Gulf War. I mean, okay. women were not technically in combat squadrons, but or in combat units, but they were getting fired at and they and some were dying. And so they were POWs as well. Right. Right. And there wasn't, you know, of course, no one wants anyone to be a POW, POW but previously, um, you know, the, the, the thought was, oh, my God, if a woman's a POW, people are going to freak out. And that's not, you know, but no, it, people, I think, appreciated that she served to the extent where she was willing to put her life on the line. Yeah. And she did well. And uh, she was sexually assaulted. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, she... she are, are men PO, male POW yeah, sexually assaulted? Right. No, I mean, good right. point. Good point. Um, so, you know, she returned with honor and there you go. Uh, I think that was the title of her book, wasn't it? Wasn't, <laughs> Something I, like that. Every returning person's, I think that was Scott O'Grady's <laughs> title as well. I don't know. But, uh, oh. so anyway, you, you, you weathered this atmospheric situation. Yes. Um, obviously you didn't go to a fleet Hornet squadron. You went to right. VAQ 137. Right. And, uh, and so that kind of allowed you to not have to fully run this to ground at that phase. Yeah. So you, you transitioned to the S3, any issues in the rag, any, any problems? No. And in, in fact, you know, uh, Captain Buckner was the rag CO and the very first day, you know, when I, when I arrived, I, you know, he had a meet and greet with all the new students and um, I talked to him separately and I said, Hey, I don't say hey to Captain. I'm like, sir, um, I just want to say, you know, I don't know what you may have heard about my experience in the F-18 rag, but, and I, like, I didn't even get to finish the sentence. He's like, look, you're here. I don't care what happened up there. We're going to 
put you through training just like everybody else goes through here. And, you know, my opinion of you is going to be based on how you do here. And we're going to give you every chance to succeed. So don't even worry about that. That's the past. And I don't care about the past. Let's just focus on your training now. And I was like, oh, thank God. So, <laughs> and the S3, yeah, no, he, he was a great leader. Um, and I, so I felt very welcomed. Um, I, um, you know, there were, there were other, there was another female student going through, so I didn't feel completely alone. And um, no, it's just a different atmosphere. You know, it, it's the S3 community, it, you know, well, S3s, okay, there's four people in a jet. And then uh, on my second deployment, it was often only two, but, you know, similar to the Tomcat, like you have to learn how to work with other people and you have to, you know, you have to be a team. And so I found the S3 community to be incredibly welcoming. I think they actually kind of like, you know, that I had come to S3s after being in Hornets. So what fleet squadron were you in? I was in VS-29, the okay. Dragon Fires. Yep. And that was CAG? CAG-11. So, uh, on board um, Lincoln. Yes, on board the Lincoln. And I found the S3B to be actually be, you know, that high wing and the round nose kind of makes you think, oh, it's not as, um, you know, sexy as a Tomcat or a Hornet. But it was actually very nimble. It was super fun to fly. Um, a lot of times did not want to land because of the high wing, but I loved flying it. I mean, it was it was a really fun jet to fly. It's fully aerobatic. I have one yeah. hop in an ES-3 when I was CAG Ops in the right seat of an ES-3, <laughs> which I very much enjoyed. Uh, plus, you can see out of it, it's got fantastic that, Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that massive bubble uh, canopy. Yes. Um, and uh, like you said, the, the, the tendency it did float. It was kind of a little bit of a glider because it had a lot yep. of uh, wing area. And you get with this air wing, and there are other female naval aviators in in the Tomcat squadron. Was there any any other females in any of the other squadrons in the air wing, or was it just VF-213? I was the only female S3 pilot. There was a female S3 NFO. We had a couple of women flying Hornets. We had a couple. Uh, we had a couple of women flying Tomcats. A to one woman Tomcat Rio. A couple uh, helicopter pilots. A couple of E2C pilots. We had three women EA6B NFOs, but I don't think we had a female prowler pilot. So, okay. yeah. So you know, a mix. I think there were eighteen of us all together. How was, how was your Let's just say treatment in 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 the S three squadron. Did you did you have to weather any of the attitudes that you had seen at at VFA one twenty five? No, I. They were amazingly supportive, and again, you know, I credit the leadership. Um, our our skipper, Commander Smith, was, um, you know, he was a we're going to get the mission done, and if if I'm if that's going to include women, then we're going to make it work, and. Um, he was another, you know, great skipper who would, um, take lots of hits for all the people in his squadron. You know, if the air boss was yelling about someone, he, the skipper would run up to the tower and go talk to the air boss. I mean, he just, he always stood up for us. We always knew that he had our back. So I think that helped a lot. And, um, it, and I just, you know, I worked with a bunch of amazing professionals. They, I found out later that, um, several of the guys I served with were, you know, they weren't happy about having women integrated. It was a big change. Um, but I never, uh, never knew that because they always treated me with the utmost professionalism. So I was really lucky because I think, some, uh, well, I know some of the other women did not enjoy that um, type of treatment and it was really tough for them. So I, I felt very fortunate that um, the S3 Bubba's were pretty welcoming. From my experience, it seemed like the women who were having the, the most difficult time as far as how they were treated by um, their squadron mates were the women in the fighter community. So um, in the Tomcat community and the Hornet community. And it, you know, that also varied based on the leadership. You know, some of the, some of the, um, you know, the commanders were, they were not happy about having women. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty obvious. Um, they were, um, they were less receptive to have women in their squadrons. Um, a lot of their identity was wrapped around this elitism, you know, and, and for good reason, right? I mean, flying a fighter jet on an aircraft carrier is pretty amazing and it and is incredibly challenging. And so they have so much to be proud of, but I don't think it was fair to only equate that ability with someone's gender. Um, 
And not every man can fly a, 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 you know, a fighter jet onto an aircraft carrier. Not every woman can either, but there are some who can and who do it really well. And why not let them be part of, you know, an effort, a squadron to, to serve in that, that manner. So, but a lot of the fighter guys back then did not feel that way. I think they felt it was, you know, it was an affront. It was, a uh, it was, um, somehow diminishing their, their reputation or diminishing their own capabilities or, and so, well, but was, I, th yeah. I think this is where it, I think this is where it gets complicated. Um, so we're again. I, I think it's it's awesome that your S three squadron was didn't give you any of the the sort of isolation vibe that I, that I'm sure the the particularly the two Tomcat pilots had. Um, were you ever a, a problem child in terms of landing at the boat? Did you ever have? Oh yeah. <laughs> As to be expected, every single woman pilot in that air wing for that deployment was a nugget. So, you know, nuggets, ha we have our challenges and, and learning, you know, the, your ways around the boat can be tough. But One of the things that made it incredibly challenging was um, we lost Kara, you know, during workups, right at the beginning of workups. And in fact, I was airborne. I was actually in the holding pattern south of the ship waiting to come in. It was during, um, we were getting a uh, carrier called on the Lincoln and, getting ready to go out to do some exercises. And so when Kara died, all the publicity, all the attention that was focused on women flying, it just takes all the pressure that you already feel um, being new to an air wing and being a nugget pilot and just, you know, incredibly intensifies that because now it's not just, you know, oh, I need to, I need to do well because I've got a crew depending on me. And because I've got, you know, this is my job and I need to do it well. Now it's like, I feel like, I've got to prove like my, I have to be able to prove my whole gender is capable of doing this. And I felt, I definitely felt a lot of pressure on my shoulders as I think every single other woman pilot in that air wing felt. I'm not saying that to excuse my poor performance, um, but it, it, there was a lot of pressure for sure. Um, and by poor performance, like I, you know, I never, I didn't go before any board. I never had, I never was um, taken off the flight schedule or anything for that. But, you know, my grades were not wonderful. I got plenty of no grades. I um, got, I had one night in particular where I boltered several times. That was no fun, um, especially when, you know, you know, 5,000 people are sitting there watching yeah. you. On the show. That, but that, like you say, you're just, a, you're your average nugget pilot, right? Yes. I mean, nuggets are going to bolter, nuggets are going to have nights in the barrel. I guess, again, the, the complicated part is the idea that there was some sort of a double standard or there was some treatment that was different for a female pilot than yeah. her male counterpart, right? So that was the yeah. charge made around uh, particularly Kara. Did you ever have those accusations leveled towards you? No. And, and, and the, the ironic thing is that um, when we finished that deployment, there was an investigation because of... Um, there were some women pilots who felt that um, they were concerned that they were being, they were experiencing discrimination, like they were getting worse grades than they should have. Um, and what the investigation found was that the leadership actually, um, it was the opposite, at least for our air wing, where there were some commanders of fighter squadrons, some of the, the fighter squadrons, where um, the, the women actually could have used some extra help. Um, and the commanders felt like they didn't, they didn't want to be perceived as giving them special treatment or, or extra flight time or more landings or things like that, which, you know, is when, when you have a, a male nugget who's struggling, um, you don't withhold training because you want to, because you're worried that they're going to, it's going to seem like they're getting extra treatment. Well, you're giving that person the treatment they need. And again, like we should be really clear, like we're not making exceptions to the standards. We have a minimum standard and people have to meet the minimums and women met the minimums for those standards. But, you know, during times when any nugget struggled, some people didn't get the help that they needed. So um, I was very lucky. I, you know, I did have my struggles, but they were never severe enough where I felt like I, I wasn't getting treatment that any other male pilot who was in my position was getting. In fact, I, there was another male pilot who was also a nugget, who was also struggling. And, you know, we both spent a lot of time with our LSOs, our landing signals officers, um, the pilots that grade 
all of our landings. And that actually was a real turning point for me because, you know, I was hearing from some of the women that they were worried um, that all of these, you know, all of this influence from outside, Kara's training records being released, you know, that never happened um, to a male pilot who had an accident. All these things that were magnifying the attention on us. I was fortunate that um, my squadron, I felt, was really supportive in that the landing signal officer, Joe Keith, um, who was our head LSO, um, you know, when I, I trusted him and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm hearing these things. I'm seeing that, you know, some of the women are, don't have great grades. And he was the one who said to me, you know, you guys are all nuggets. So that's not a surprise. And, you know, let's go take a look at your landings. And I'm, I mean, he spent time to go through and look at my landings with me and, um, you know, and he'd point out, this is what this, this is, this is why I think you're doing this. And this is what you should be thinking about when you're landing. And, you know, again, this is, um, this is what you do when people on your team are having challenges is you support them, you don't just leave them out in the cold. And so I was really lucky that I had good leaders in my squadron, like Flojo, who um, took me aside and showed me, you know, all the things about landings and, you know, really broke it down for me. And I ended up going up, up on the LSO platform every single time I could when I wasn't flying. And I learned, you know, I really learned about um, all the subtleties and um, how you can really start seeing the energy state of the jet and all these things. Um, so much that I actually became an LSO. And, um, you know, that was one of my favorite things that I did on the ship was, um, was learning about how managing the energy on the jet and um, all the different things to be thinking about. And it was just like a, you know, PhD level <laughs> landing um, training. But, but you know, um, to my own personal credit, <laughs> I will say, it was because I, I, I had faith in the leaders in my squadron. And I was lucky that I had leaders who um, were supporting the integration of women, even though they, a lot of them personally didn't agree with it. Did you know Kara uh, before the mishap? How, how well did you know Kara Holtgren? I didn't know her super well. The Navy had this meeting for women pilots on the West Coast, and it was all about um, trying to understand and figure out how we were going to be able to pee if we had to go on a long mission. So we're all sitting in this room. They gave us each, you know, these paper bags full of um, uh, pedal packs and um, diapers. <laughs> it was just horrible, but you know, it's a valid concern. Okay. How, how's this going to work? You know, when you're strapped into an ejection seat, you can't really, if you're a woman, it's, it's tough to uh, uh, wiggle out of it. You know, it's a lot easier for the guys. So um, so I met Kara at that meeting and we talked briefly after that. And, um, but that was really the only time I knew of her. Um, we had, you know, several of the other women pilots in um, VAQ 34 knew her. Um, so like we knew of each other, but um, we hadn't, you know, we just hadn't spent that much time together. And unfortunately, like that happened right at the beginning of the, um, us all showing up at the air wing and her mishap happened um, right at the beginning of workup. So um, unfortunately I did not get to know her better. You, um, you were unaware of any struggles or the, the, the 213 atmosphere specifically, or, or, you know, again, you're, you're busy trying yeah. to get your act together in your squadron. You can't really go, you know, what's happening over there in the fighter squadron. Yeah. It wasn't like, Oh my God, this female's on the watch list and she's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of no. rumor and innuendo about her training records and all the other stuff that came out after the fact. And, and as you said, it was sort of, that became sort of this lightning rod event for everybody else and where all of the naysayers could go, see, this is what we were trying to tell you. You know, the airplane doesn't yeah. know what gender it is. You guys, you know, let her have X number of downs through the rag and you, you know, ignored the other trends because you're so interested in, in force feeding, um, you know, females into every community, including the Tomcat yeah. community. And yeah, I'll admit it. I mean, we, we took pride in the fact that the airplane uh, was super fast and powerful and the pilots took pride in the fact that it wasn't easy to land. Yeah. And we're like, you know, Hey, I got it that we should be equal opportunity here, but 
you know, have you seen the fact that this airplane is really, really demanding? Yeah. You know, so I think the criticism was around the standard of performance. Um, and, and again, that's why my question to you was, did, did you, to a prohibitive degree, were you ever uh, on any LSO watch list? You couldn't fly at night or, you know, that, that, that kind of a thing. And I think the answer is no. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think that's, that's, again, I don't, I didn't know her. I wasn't in 213. You know, I know people who were, and it's funny, you, you emailed me um, about the, some of that, that, that video, yeah. that video. My first response was, you know, we're lucky you were in an S3 squadron, right? Um, which I was. I, <laughs> I mean, were, yeah. Right. Um, Cause you know, an A squadron pre DFCS um, that particular squadron during that era, which I've documented uh, with the Stacey Bates episode, you know, this was, this was sort of a confluence of, of the worst of all pressures. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the end, it's a, an immense tragedy. Uh, and then everything comes out. Everybody goes to their corner yeah. and, and kind of says, you know, look, you guys weren't fair. And she was doomed because she didn't have the support that you're talking about. And the other side is like, look, we told you, Senator so-and-so, that this was, there's a natural order out here that you cannot screw with because you're going to get people killed. And now you've yeah. got somebody killed. Yeah. You know, and between those two things, brave pioneers like you were left to figure it out and not just survive, but attempt to thrive against that backdrop. So an already yeah. tough situation got even harder. The, this was a weird time, a very specific <laughs> time. And when you go to Tailhook yeah. now and you see the integration piece and it's no big deal, you know, I mean, they're wearing the, the shit hots and the bowling shirts and they're, you know, it's not like, oh, and there's this, we have these two female pilots and it's kind of weird, but we're going to try to be kid gloves with them, you know, because yeah. God forbid you, you make an issue out of it because then that's the end of your career. Uh, you know, all of that is 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 gone uh, yeah. by and large, right? And this is the path that you had to forge. You know, I think what all of us wanted was we, we wanted to be measured on our own merit and our own skills, and, but we also wanted a, a level playing field. And I think some of the women felt that, it wasn't a level of playing field that, you know, things were stacked against us. You um, know, I, I don't know if I want to go into this, so I'll, I'll bring it up. Well, okay. So let me add, what was there okay. any like straight up sexual harassment that, that you faced and how did you, how did you respond to that? Um, sexual harassment. I mean, like I, I so, you know, I was married at the time and uh, the one, the one person who did like, uh, kind of proposition me at, during Liberty at a bar one time was an F-14 Rio, <laughs> but that was, you know, I, I don't know if I consider that harassment. Yeah, he was drunk and being an idiot. So <laughs> I don't know what to say, but no, I mean, harassment. Uh... Well, I guess I'm talking about the subtleties, the, your treatment by the, the random mm. guy in the passageway yeah. in, you know, while working out in the gym, uh, while in the line for a P boat, you know, these yeah. are the subtle things yeah. while getting a slider at mid rats, those yeah. kinds of things, not the overt, like, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing <laughs> something here. Should we go make it happen at a yeah. bar? Right. Not, yeah. not, okay. And no, and, no, I, I no, apologize I mean, on behalf of all Tomcat Rios everywhere. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, you know, it's just like your day-to-day -day existence. Were you always yeah. fighting this or, or was this sort of, at some point it became, there was a normalcy that allowed you to let your guard down. I, this is like the era of the yellow card and the red card. I don't, do you remember that word? Like when, if you said something that might be yeah. offensive, you're supposed yes. to hold up like a yellow or whatever. So or just someone, say it. you would say, yeah, it. just a yellow card. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, you know, based on, I think soccer. Um, well, that, yeah. That was the gen one sexual harassment training. Yeah. Right. So that was like the first version of it. Yeah. And, you know, we had, and so we each had our little laminated, uh, our, like, this was not an official Navy thing at all. It was more kind of like a, we're rolling our eyes at it, but um, we had someone in the squadron made these little laminated cards that were yellow on one side and red on the other. And so, um, you know, and so we, we kind of joked about it, but I, I honestly, I never felt um, harassed at my squadron. I, it, I felt like um, uh, I felt very comfortable, you know, uh, 
giving the other guys a hard time. They gave me a hard time, you know, but it was all in a very like familial, it was like having 35 big brothers giving me you know, a hard time. And, um, but they also, I also felt like, you know, they were looking out for me. So, um, so no, I, I did not experience sexual harassment in my fleet squadrons. Well, so that, that the only integrated deployment I did was my CAG ops tour. And we had two female Intel officers and that's exactly how they described the relationship of the CAG staff was I felt like I had uh, I, Christina Schlenz, who I just saw out in San Diego last week. Um, she said, I felt like I had six big brothers, which yeah. I thought was a really cool way to, and that sort of suggested to me that we were doing it right in terms yeah. of the atmosphere. Um, and it wasn't all, you know, roses the whole time. And we, uh, one of our guys in the CAG, uh, staff spaces and the CAG ops spaces had a, uh, Hooters screensaver. Um, there was no nudity, but it, you know, it was yeah. girl, girls in bikinis. And, yeah. uh, one of the two Intel officers, uh, took issue with that and went to CAG and he's like, you got to get rid of that screensaver. And, and so we, that was like the hill we were willing to die on, yeah. you know, and, and we, we figured it out and we worked through it and, you know, it's like, okay, do we really care about this? And if that's how it makes you feel, is that cool? And, yeah. you know, and so we, we figured it out, you know, through, we were, we used our words, right. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and talked it out. And I think this is what we've learned over all these decades, but we had to, to work through it, you know, and that's yeah. what you, you got to do, you know, and, and, uh, Obviously, you fl you faced it with uh, with both uh, resilience and uh, and you bear the scars in some ways of having done that. Right? The therapy bills, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you did two cruises, mm -hmm. and and then what? How much longer did you stay in, and and, and what then? What happened? Yeah, um, after my second deployment, I went to the RAG. So I became an instructor pilot at the Fleet Replacement Squadron. So basically, teaching all of the new. S3B pilots, how to fly the S3 and how to land it on the aircraft carrier. I was an LSO at the RAG as well. And so that was a blast. I, I loved, um, you know, going out for a bag ops and being able to get a bunch of daytime carrier landings, which, you know, at that, by that point, they were super fun. <laughs> by the time you're a RAG instructor, it was like, that was the best. So um, and then I, uh, I was at the end of my required service. So I had to serve seven years after I got my wings. And so, you know, basically 10 years. And as I finished up my time at the, the RAG, um, almost every single instructor pilot that I was serving with uh, was going to the airlines. And I wasn't sure that I really wanted to do that. It kind of felt like becoming a bus driver after driving a race car. And I really, one of the things I loved about being a naval officer was leading teams. And so I, you know, I loved being a division officer and I, I wanted to do more of that. So I ended up going to business school instead of to the airlines. And I came out here to Silicon Valley after that and spent the last 20 years working in tech companies and startups and really loved it because I, I feel like I got to use a lot of the skills that I developed in the Navy. Um, uh, you know, not just the um, staying calm in stressful situations, you know, that I got to learn uh, as a, as an aviator, but also, um, you know, a lot of the management leadership, problem solving skills, resiliency, for sure, all those things translated really well to, uh, to the tech world. And so now I'm also involved with organizations that help veterans um, who are getting out of the military, get into the tech uh, industry. And um, you know, that's what actually one of my favorite things to do is to mentor veterans who are looking to transition into tech careers. You and I were colleagues at military.com. We're both uh, acolytes of the founder of military.com, our good friend, Chris Michael. Uh, he brought me aboard and then in short order, he brought you aboard. So you were the VP of marketing. I was the editor. Um, so we got to work together there. So I have seen you in action in the tech sector. Uh, it is a very specific talent that you have to have to to make it. And, and you've had a number of jobs, as you've said. Uh, that's basically all you've done since you got out of B school. And so the ability to thrive in the tech sector is uh, is rare. And you you are one of those who's who's managed to do that. I should mention that you're also an author. So your book, She's Just Another Navy Pilot, captures all of this stuff in, in, in greater detail than we've gone over here. You just had 
a one woman play off Broadway called I Feel the Need. So tell us a little bit about that. I've been writing with a, a group for a few years and it's you know a lot of personal narrative writing and the Navy stories always really seem to resonate with other people because it is a unique experience, you know, living on an aircraft carrier flying. Um, it's something that, you know, not everyone gets to do. So the woman who runs the workshops recommended that I put my stories together and, and maybe think about doing a one woman show from it. And so I pulled a bunch of stories together and then, you know, created a kind of an arc to the story just about my own life of growing up as a Marine Corps brat and then serving in the Navy. And then I talk about, you know, a, a little bit about my life after that and some of the struggles I've had, um, you know, in my own, my personal life. And so um, the show was an, an opportunity to share my story um, so that other people hopefully will know that, um, you know, women can do this job. You know, I never knew it growing up. I didn't know any women pilots. And so I'm hoping that by telling my story and sharing my story this way, that, um, that young women will, will recognize that this is a viable career and, and an amazing career um, and that they'll be more interested in serving as well. Uh, so it's had its run on, on off Broadway. Off Broadway it, yeah. it, was it, did you tape a performance? Will people be able to see it? Uh, what's, what's up with that? Yeah. So the next thing I'm doing is um, I've been invited to perform the show at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland in August. So it will be, um, I think it's actually the 75th anniversary of the Fringe. So it's, a, it's an amazing entertainment festival in Scotland where it's, you know, it's one person shows, it's music acts, it's comedy. It's just like, you know, uh, hours and hours of entertainment every day for three weeks. So I'll be performing my show there for three weeks in August. And, and after that, I don't know, I'm, um, you know, I'm interested in potentially uh, performing on stage at, um, you know, in, in areas where there is a military presence um, and people will hopefully be entertained by the show. Um, but at this point right now, the only thing I have in the future for the show is the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So thank you for coming by the channel and, and telling us your story. And uh, I hope our paths cross again soon. You got to get out here to the East Coast because I don't think I'm coming out to the West Coast <laughs> anytime in the near future. So uh, again, I hope our paths cross very soon. Me too. Thanks, Mitch. This was a lot of fun. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch, including Where to Get the Punks Trilogy, my first three novels about life in an F-14 squadron, now available as a Kindle. So go to Amazon.com to check that out. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarol. And in the meantime... I look forward to talking to you again soon.